I'm Christy Maver, VP of Marketing at Numenta, here with Jeff Hawkins, co-founder at Numenta. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Christy. And today we're doing the second video in our series where we're talking about your new book that's out on March 2nd, A Thousand Brains, A New Theory of Intelligence. Uh, so in, in this video today, we're going to talk about part one. Um, the book has three parts. Uh, the first part is a new understanding of the brain. The second part is machine intelligence. And part three is human intelligence. So today we will talk about part one, a new understanding of the brain. So I think my first question for you is when you say a new understanding of the brain, uh, what part of the brain are you talking about? Is it the whole brain? What's what? What yeah, that's, it, of course, you know, we're talking about the human brain primarily, although uh, um, scientists study lots of different brains, but we're going to talk most about the human brain. And in the human brain, there's lots of different parts, um, dozens of different little regions and so on. But there's one part that dominates the human brain. It's the neocortex. Sometimes people just call it the cortex. Uh, and it's about 70% of your brain. So it's, it's the big wrinkly thing that covers almost everything else if you, if you look at a picture of a human brain. So we study that primarily, and the book is primarily about the neocortex, although we can't ignore the other parts of the brain. So the book covers the whole spectrum a bit, understanding how the neocortex works relative to the other parts of the brain. So you we kind of cover the whole thing, but really the theory that's produced in the book, the discoveries we made are about how the neocortex works, which is again, 70% of your brain. So it's really, it's the organ of intelligence. It's the thing that makes humans unique. It's, you know, my, my neocortex is speaking right now and, Yours is listening and, and seeing mm -hmm. things. It's all about the intelligence is all about the neocortex. So that's primarily what the book is about. But we do talk a lot about the other parts of the brain because to you, they, they make a big difference when we understand what humanity is. So the, the title of the book, A Thousand Brains, of course, is a nod to the Thousand Brains Theory of Intelligence, the theory yeah. that, that you were mentioning. And, and a lot of part one is really about the discoveries um, that led to the, the creation of the theory. So can you talk about those discoveries and, and kind of outline some of the key points? Yeah. So the book does do a, a sort of a concise chronology of how we got to this theory. Uh, I think it's important. I'm not going to walk through those here. Um, but I would say there were two very key um, discoveries that, um, that play a central role in the book in understanding how our brain works and what intelligence is. Um, before I tell you those, uh, I need to just tell you what generally what's going on in your brain. Um, one of the th most important things to realize is that intelligence is not our ability to take some input from our eyes and ears and then act upon it immediately. Well, intelligence is, is about learning a model of the world. And so you, in your brain, you have a model, you've, rec you've stored a model of all the things you've seen and, and experienced. And it's literally a model. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's, it's a way of the brain can, can say, how does the world work? And why do I know where is where and what is what? And how do things work and feel and so on? And this is all stored in the neurons in your head. You learn this in your life. And so it's all about building a model and intelligence is about having a model of the world. It's, it's, and the smarter we are, the better our model is. Now that's a pretty common understanding of the brain. Not every neuroscientist understands that, but it's pretty common that we have to have this model ahead. What we've discovered now is the key to how that model works. Uh, and that's really fascinating actually. It's just totally fascinating. And the, the two key discoveries we made, we did not anticipate even uh, five years ago. Uh, so there were surprising discoveries. The first is, um, is uh, and you have to understand both of them. Uh, the first is that, uh, that the neocortex doesn't have one model of the world. It has thousands and thousands of separate complementary models of things. So I have a coffee cup next to me right here. And if I say there's a model of what coffee cups are like in my head, because that's, I know how to use them. I know what they feel like uh, I know what they, they look like. Um, I don't have one model of a coffee cup. I actually have thousands of models of the coffee cup. There's some for how the cup feels and some for how the cup looks like and how the temperatures and so on. So that was the first thing is that it's like not one model. There are thousands of complementary models and they vote together to, to, to produce our consensus model of the world. And the second big discovery was, and this was really the key, this is the thing that unraveled the whole thing, um, is that we learned that the way these models work is they store information in what's, what we, in the book I refer to as reference frames. Uh, that's just a fancy word that means it's a, it's a structure. You can think of it like a X, Y, and Z coordinate, something like that. Um, where it, there's a structure, the neurons literally create 
these structures where information is stored. So when I think about the model of the coffee cup in my head, there literally is a model that says these different parts of the cup are related to each other through reference frames, like where are they, how they positioned relative to each other. And, and so this is how we learn the structure of physical things like the coffee cup, but it also turns out that's how we learn the structure of everything. So if we learn mathematics or we do language or we do politics or art, it's all based on reference frames. And uh, we understand this in fairly great detail now. Um, and it's not, it's not something, it's something everyone can understand. So, but it takes, I have to walk you through it in the book to get you to fully grasp it. But in a sense, it's, it tells us how knowledge is stored in the brain. What does it mean to know something? And well, how that in reference frames, reference frames make knowledge actionable. So again, that was a long answer, um, but think of it this way. The neocortex builds a model of the world, but it's not one model. It's thousands of models that work together. You're not aware of that, but that's what's going on. And then each model is built on reference frames, which explains what it means to know something. Yeah, fascinating. <laughs> I think so. It's really yeah. cool. <laughs> I'm still not over it yet. <laughs> and and I want to reiterate that uh, it, I, in the first video uh, you mentioned, you know, we Numenta has scientific papers on these discoveries, but not, I think it's fair to say most people, uh, even some scientists, it's hard to read a neuroscience paper. So the idea yeah. of for, yeah. for anybody to be able to pick it up, and as you said, you walk through. Yeah, how it it's works. hard. You know, when you write scientific papers, it's a it's they're hard to read. Um, but also it's very difficult to tell a very big picture story. And, um, and that's what's required here, you know, because when you do a scientific paper, you kind of tackle one little piece of it here and another little piece of it here and another piece of it here. And it's very difficult to piece it all together in sort of a, a framework. And um, so that's the book really plays a, a, a nice role in that regard. That's why you need a book actually. Um, right. it, it, you can't, I mean, you wouldn't want, most people wouldn't want to read all these papers. Or, Right. Although I describe them in the book, I describe where you can find them. And yes, they're want, they're referenced. <laughs> yeah, if you want to read them, it's great. But start with the book first. Right. So this this theory of intelligence uh, in the neocortex. I mean, intelligence covers a broad range of topics. So um, how does the theory en encompass all of that? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, and I describe in the book how we developed the theory, where we started, but then how we expanded beyond that. So. I mean, I'm gonna give you a little story. And I tell this story in the book uh, about a famous man named Vernon Mountcastle, who was a neuroscientist. And uh, he was at Johns Hopkins University and he studied the neocortex. And uh, many decades ago, he proposed a surprising idea. Now you, got, now you imagine that in your brain, you got this neocortex, which is this big wrinkly thing that's 70% that's of your brain, but it's like this big sheet of cells that get wrapped around everything else, you know? And so it's, it's like a size of a dinner napkin and it's like two millimeters thick and different parts of the neocortex do different things. So there's parts that do vision and language and touch and hearing and things like that. And what Vernon Malkhouse proposed, he says, even though there's all these different parts of the neocortex or, that seem to be doing different things, they all work on the same principle, that they all are essentially doing the same thing. And he proposed that vision is the same as touch, which is the same as hearing. He proposed then that everything we do and think about the, the intelligence is really based on the same algorithm, which is an incredible idea. And yes, there's a huge amount of data supporting it, but it's very, very difficult to figure out what that algorithm is. Like what, what, how is language the same as touching? You know, when I touch my coffee cup, how does it relate to language? I mean, it doesn't seem like they're, they're related, but the evidence from the neuroscience point of view says they are the same, that the networks, the structure, the neurons, the, the details in the cortex that do these different things look the same. So that was Vernon Mountcastle's proposal. It very, very, uh, I, I make a point in the book saying it's a little bit like Darwin's proposal. Darwin's proposal, all this diversity of life that we see around us from you know broccoli and plants to birds and fish and humans mm -hmm. is really based on the same evolutionary algorithm. We're all derived from the same thing. And that was a surprising idea. And, and, and Vernon Malkos have proposed something else surprising. He says, this, everything we think about is intelligence, it's really the same thing. It's like, really, how could that be? So that's a long way of saying that what we did in our research, we said, let's focus on some particular aspect of intelligence. And if we understand it really well, then we can expand to other things. So we, uh, we, we thought, taught a lot about touch and vision and the actual discoveries we made, it came about when thinking about touch. Uh, and how literally what has to happen if you have a, an object such as this coffee cup and you're moving your finger over it and, and for your brain to understand what it's feeling, 
Um, it's really miraculous that it can do that. Um, but how it does that, that led to the core of this, this discovery about the reference frames and the different models and so on. But then we said, well, if that's true, then it has to apply to everything else uh, about the cortex. And, and, and part of the book is dedicated to that. I have, um, I talk about vision and touch and hearing, but then I have a whole chapter called Concepts, Language and High Level Thinking. That's chapter six. And that chapter says, how does the same theory apply to things we think like, like mathematics or language? Um, things that, you, that aren't even physically tangible, like a, like a coffee cup, you know? Right. Um, and, and can the same principles apply? And, it, it's, and they can. Uh, and so then that's a, it's a really interesting, uh, intellectually interesting chapter in the book because we realize that thinking about something, whether it's thinking about music or thinking about science or thinking about uh, mathematics, is very much analogous to moving your finger through a physical thing like a coffee cup. You're moving your thoughts through a space in a reference frame uh, and recalling stored information in the same way that when you move your finger over the coffee cup, you're moving it in the reference frame of the coffee cup and recalling information about the coffee cup. Um, so I think, I think we, we managed to bridge that gap between what Vernon Mountcastle proposed many decades ago, which seemed impossible at the time, to like, I think we know what it is. We think we know what Vernon Mountcastle's algorithm is. And, and it's kind of a beautiful, elegant thing. At least I, I think so. And I try to make that argument in the book. Yeah. I think that chapter might be one that is, uh, is reread. <laughs> As yeah. I re I had to reread it. Because it, it's it, because it's hard or because it's interesting. Know, no, not because it's hard, but because it's so surprising. Because, yeah, yeah. I think yeah. you know. I yeah. I think when things are surprising, then it sometimes does take a, a, a read or two to get it right. Um, and there, as you pointed out earlier, there are a lot of surprising things in this book. There, um, I mean, we've gotten enough people have read the book now. We've gotten quite a bit of feedback on it, and uh, that's one of the common themes. Is like you know. People say, well, you know, most books have, you know, they have a topic and they develop it. And it's like, this book's got like 10 topics, you know? <laughs> but, but they all tie together. So I think there's a good excuse for covering so much material in, in a single book. And, and I try to make it really tried hard uh, and working with you actually, uh, trying to make it readable um, for anybody. Well, as you mentioned at the at the end of part one, I mean, part one really is dedicated to laying out the theory, the discoveries that led to it, and really walking someone through so that you can understand this theory of intelligence and how it applies to all aspects of intelligence. And then uh, we turn to what does that mean? What's the impact for machine intelligence, which we get to in part two? And what does that even mean for, for human intelligence and the future of humanity, uh, which is part three? So next time we chat, we will talk about part two, machine intelligence. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Great. <laughs> and we'll put a link uh, in the YouTube description here um, where you can uh, pre-order the book on Amazon, which again comes out March 2nd, A Thousand Brains, A New Theory of Intelligence. Thanks so much, Jeff, for your time. Thank you, Christy. And we'll talk again soon. We'll back. All right. Take care.